All right, welcome everybody to our Pen AI Tech or Pen Artificial Intelligence and Technology Collaboratory for Healthy Aging webinar. Uh, Pen AI Tech is an initiative funded by the National Institute on Aging. Uh, and uh, we continue with today's webinar and we are very happy to have with us as our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Desmond Upton Patton who is the Brian and Randy Schwartz University Professor and the 31st Penn Integrates Knowledge University Professor. He has joined appointments in the School of Social Policy and Practice and the Annenberg School for Communication, along with a secondary appointment in the Department of Psychiatry in the Perlman School of Medicine. Professor Patton's groundbreaking research into the relationship between social media and gang violence specifically how communities constructed online can influence often harmful behavior offline, has led to his becoming the most cited and recognized scholar in this increasingly important area of social science. And we are thrilled to have him today as our webinar speaker. Uh, and before we get started, I want to remind our audience that you can um, write your questions in the Q&A box and uh, upon uh, conclusion, we will have some time for questions and discussion, so we will be uh, answering your questions at the end of Dr. Patton's talk. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Patton. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, George. I'm going to attempt to share my slides seamlessly. We'll see how this goes. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move this down here so I can see things. All right, so again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, today, I wanna focus on the broader impact social media has on gun violence prevention and how I've used artificial intelligence to do this work. For almost a decade, I have understood and studied social media as a neighborhood, an environmental context where youth spend an enormous amount of time building community, exchanging ideas, developing and running social movements, and on the other end, engage in and exposed to trauma, harm, grief, and violence expressed in text, video, images, live stream, and the like. Critical to this journey has been an, an, a, an intentional transdisciplinary approach and integration of ideas and theories and methods in order to define and analyze uh, and widely disseminate findings and challenges surrounding this new area of study of social media and gun violence. My work is powered by the SAFE Lab, for which I am the founding director. The lab is focused on examining the ways in which youth of color navigate violence on and offline, drawing on computational social work approaches to research and communication theories. We engage in qualitative and natural language processing and computer vision methods to understand the mechanisms of violence and how to prevent and intervene in violence that occurs in neighborhoods and social media environments. So the problem of social media as a trigger or amplifier of gun violence is not just a story about how users engage social media platforms. It must also contend with how platforms are designed, how artificial intelligence and other emerging technology tools are deployed to control what you see and the community guidelines that are developed to mitigate harm for some. Uh, the problem of social media uh, is a transdisciplinary issue that requires an integration of not only methods and theories, but also reimagining of who was at the table, what true community collaboration looks like, a centering of marginalized voices, ideas, and beliefs that goes beyond checkboxes and window dressing. It also requires a 21st century research infrastructure that supports inclusive and equitable mass collaborations, transparency, and deep and critical reflection and reflexivity on potential harms and non-negotiables as a standard science practice. So I believe social work should be at the forefront of technology design and development and deployment of, of AI's real world applications. And so in my work, I posit the idea of social work thinking as an apparatus of social change within the context of, of design and artificial intelligence. Social work thinking leverages the National Association of Social Work Code of Ethics, ideas like honoring the dignity and worth of every person, 
centering the importance of human relationships and engaging in trustworthy practices anchor how social work thinking can be applied in ethical AI design. So my work at the intersections of gun violence and social media are motivated by two issues. One, gun violence is clearly an epidemic in the United States and particularly acute in cities like Chicago. At the height of my studies, the city experienced a 58% increase in homicides between a, within a two year period. And at the same time, youth are using social media at enormous rates. Twitter use in particular, um, Twitter uh, at, at the crux of my research was of high prevalence among black youth. So what we know is that youth have fully embraced social media and often the family experts on how to use various platforms available to us. Youth stated motivations for using social media is quite similar to traditional forms of communication. Stay in touch and, with friends and make plans and to get to know other people and, present, and to present one's identity or intersectional identities. Data from Pew suggests that 92% of youth are online daily and 71% of those young people use more than one social media site. And of those teens that are on social media, um, there are between 20, 10 and 2015, when I began this work, there were um, at least 45% of Black teens were using Twitter. So most of the work that I will talk about today will be Twitter focused. And so I have become interested in understanding the role of technology and violence transmission more generally. So what we've seen over the last decade or so is a merger of complex beefs and taunts within and between crews and cliques that are expressed in short pithy posts and images that lack context, nuance, nuance, or any broader explanation. So what we see now is what Jeffrey Lane calls the digital street or what Robin Stevens calls the digital neighborhood. Now, the digital street is subtly different from the physical street in that it alters how people connect and it restructures daily life by shaping identities, decisions, and behaviors of youth, and thus potentially impacting exposure to harm or increased risk for injury or death. And so I wanna take you on a journey with me. It's 2012, um, I, have, uh, I have defended my dissertation at the University of Chicago. I did a dissertation that examined how high achieving black boys um, and young men navigate violence in one of the most violent neighborhoods in Chicago. And in our interviews together, one of the things that kept coming up um, in those interviews was the role and impact of Twitter. And what was really interesting is that these young boys and men were using Twitter to navigate violence in the neighborhood. It would help them to know where activity was happening, who would be attending what party and where. Um, it would help them to know um, how big or small their, their um, their community is and um, who might be potentially threatening within that space. And so after my PhD defense, I then moved on to the University of Michigan um, as an assistant professor and wanted to um, further study this particular phenomenon. And at the same time, there was a pretty um, significant event that happened on Twitter in Chicago. There were two very well-known rappers um, that were um, from rival gangs on the south side of Chicago. And one of those individuals essentially became fed up with the back and forth on Twitter, and he posted his exact location on Twitter. And um, he was killed um, within two hours after posting his location. And so I wanted to better understand um, the role of social media, in particular Twitter, in facilitating that exchange and perhaps um, causing or um, amplifying um, harmful conversation that could have led to this individual's death. And so with colleagues from the University of Chicago, uh, we wrote a conceptual paper uh, about this phenomenon by interrogating the computer mediated communications literature, um, reviewing um, tons of YouTube videos and having conversations with young people about the ways in which they see their life and their engagement in the neighborhood through Twitter. And so we wrote a paper called Internet Banging, New Trends in Social Media, Gang Violence and Masculinity, which essentially coined this term and, and then kind of launched my career in this space. Now, critical to this work is trustworthy community-based partnerships. 
Uh, without trustworthy partnerships in the local communities of Chicago, I would not have been able to study this phenomenon, to chat with youth um, about their experiences, or to really understand the problem of gun violence fully. So I partnered with Eddie Bocanegra, who at the time was the executive director of the violence prevention program at the YMCA. And one of the things that was really important about that relationship in the beginning is that he grilled me for two hours before he allowed me to work with any young people that he was connected with because he wanted to make sure that this use of social media and artificial intelligence would not be damaging or harmful to the young people. So I guess I passed that test and he allowed, he helped me to recruit a number of young people from across the city to learn more about the relationship between social media life and um, um, gun and gang violence. And so he and I uh, partnered together to, uh, to um, commence the internet um, banging study, uh, which was sponsored by the University of Michigan Office of Research. And so this was a collaboration between Eddie's group at the YMCA and my lab, the Safe Lab at the University of Michigan at that time. And so essentially, this was a qualitative study in which we talked with a number of Black boys and men, around 34 individuals. And we also talked to outreach workers. These are folks who, are, who would consider themselves violence interrupters or managers at violence prevention organizations. And we wanted to understand what they knew about social media and some of the challenges and opportunities of leveraging social media to advance violence prevention efforts. And so our central research question was, What's the role of social media? What role does social media play in gang violence? And so we learned a lot from those outreach workers. And in particular, we learned a lot about um, how they perceived young people navigating social media and some of the chief content areas that needed to be focused on and examined more deeply within a social media context. So this is one of this is an excerpt from one of those interviews from an outreach worker. And so the outreach worker tells us when somebody dies, you know, it, hap it hasn't happened since um, leadership found out, gang leadership, but when guys would die, they would make a Facebook page, such and such Watts page, instead of being like Jose Garcia's page. It was, for instance, Speedy Watts, and then it would be a picture of him, and then you know they would draw disrespectful symbols like a penis around his mouth and blood stains all over it, and it would fuel more stuff. And so we then began to understand that in order to truly understand like this pathway between posting and violence, we needed to understand the triggering events that would then shift language and engagement on social media that would then trigger offline interactions and engagements that could lead to violence offline. So that qualitative work really seeded um, a couple of ideas. Number one, that having a thick, descriptive, contextually informed approach is really important, particularly with doing work in vulnerable populations, and in particular doing work where um, social media speak and African African American language were um, the texts that we will be reviewing. We also understood that the kind of gold standard artificial intelligence tools would not be useful in being able to automatically identify um, concepts in this language because it was unfamiliar with this language um, with these particular dialects. This work was then deepened and advanced when I came to know Ja'Kyra Barnes. And this particular individual changed the course of my research, uh, my ideas and thoughts around artificial intelligence, and really shaped my, my um, emerging thoughts around AI and ethics. So this is Ja'Kyra Barnes. Um, I came to know Ja'Kyra um, in a Chicago Sun-Times article, which called her the gun-toting gang girl of Chicago. Ja'Kyra was exposed to violence at a very young age um, and had recurrent experiences with death and loss. Uh, just weeks after her first birthday, her father was shot and killed. As she entered her formative teenage years, she, she joined a gang in the Woodlawn neighborhood of Chicago, just blocks from where I was studying at the University of Chicago. The, the death that seemed to impact Ja'Kyra the most was that of her friend Taekwon Tyler, 
a 13-year-old boy murdered in their neighborhood, and she saw him be gunned down because they were at the same party together. She then adopted the Twitter handle at Taekwon Assassin in reference to him. Before Jakira's own brutal and untimely death on April 11th, her, little, her friend, Little B, was shot and killed by the Chicago police on March 29th. And so her friend, um, little, P, little B, was murdered on March 29th, and then Jakira would then be murdered on April 11th, just a few weeks later. And so initially, I wanted to see if we could examine Jakira's Twitter life to see if there would be any signs of retaliation or potential retaliation. But one of the biggest mistakes in, this, um, in, in the beginning of this project was how we conceptualized the research question uh, and how we did not, how I did not check my own biases. And one of the things that, that, I, became, that I began to understand is that I had been imbibing uh, white toxic and supremacist views about black children myself and that it viewed how I understood Jakaira, the types of questions that I would have been asked of AI and social media to better understand Jakaira, only looking at her as a bloodthirsty killer, a bad actor, a harmful person. And so, um, you know, when we, when, the, when those um, transcripts were downloading in my mind, I then, I then uh, directed how we would then look for and annotate data. And so of course we found exactly what we perceived to be as bad. We saw things like Vernon, that's the gun line, you cross it, you end up on the headlines. Anyone can get these hands in this life, you're lacking. You see the ops, fuck it, we're gonna smoke them. But what Jakira Barnes did in death is that she forced me to see her humanity. She forced me to see a full child who had experienced more death, more pain, more trauma than probably most of us were experienced in a lifetime. And so I then had the opportunity to wrestle with um, Jakira's grief and trauma. Things like, on foreign and the ops killed my bro bro, broken heart. And the one post that continues to haunt me to this day is the line, my struggle ain't been told. And it was a call out to a struggle of gun violence, of children of gun violence that are affected, that are traumatized, and that end up becoming perpetrators um, as they are also victims as well. And so it really um, forced me to reimagine the types of questions we could answer with artificial intelligence and it forced me to reckon with the need to have deeper contextual and qualitative analysis of social media posts that could then train a set of algorithmic systems to think more like the community in which the social media data comes from. So one of the things that came out of uh, that learning, those sets of learnings were, was the, a process for centering marginalized voices and centering context and nuance. And so we developed the uh, CHASM approach. Um, CHASM is the contextual analysis of social media. Um, through CHASM, uh, we provide a methodological process to contextually driven and domain specific decisions to labeling social media data for the training of algorithmic systems. So the goal is to really push ourselves to move beyond simple binary classifications to dig into deeper meanings that can be helpful for us to um, understand and unpack these really hard and complex situations. The CASM approach serves as a method to bridge the identified gap between inadequacies in current language processing tools and differences in geographic, cultural, and age-related variants of social media use and communication. CASM focuses on utilizing a team-based approach to annotating and qualitatively analyzing social media data, explicitly grounded by deep community expertise and understanding. This process yields rich qualitative analysis as well as in-depth annotations that easily feed into natural language processing systems to improve accuracy for, these, for this work. However, the focus on context also offers an opportunity to think about the ethical risks of this work that are directly related to improving accuracy. 
And so critical to this process is to work with domain experts. And so this required us to reimagine expertise. Expertise doesn't necessarily have to come from individuals with PhDs and have expertise within a particular social science domain. Here, we have reimagined expertise to be lived experience and that this lived experience is critical for us to interpret language, to interpret meaning, to interpret context, and to interpret the directionality of language that may help us to understand why a post could inform or trigger an offline violent event. These are the young people that we hired to work in our lab as domain experts. These are young people from uh, Chicago um, who we found through our community-based partnerships. They would work with us for three months or six months or an academic year, and they would provide us with translation of social media posts, of textual posts and images. They would provide us deeper context around an image um, and help us to discern you know, a rap lyric from an innocuous post. Um, and they also were consultants. Uh, we chatted with them quite a bit about the ethical um, dilemma of deploying these particular methodologies in their communities and really wanted to grapple with them whether or not these tools are helpful or harmful. And so these young people are critically instrumental um, in, in, in this process. And I would say, and I would argue that we um, should not and could not have done this work without their uh, involvement. So I'm going to walk you through um, the CASM process, give you a kind of a quick um, demo of how we leverage the CHASM process and our work with domain experts. And so we built an annotation system called um, VETAS in which you would then input um, Twitter posts from Jakaira. We collected um, up to a million posts from Jakaira and individuals within her network for which she had the most mentions and replies. And we fed those tweets into the system. We created two sets of annotation groups. We had um, in students who were training in social work at Columbia University um, who were um, reading and reviewing those posts. And then we also have the domain experts, those young people that you just saw, who would then validate what we saw from the student annotators at the end of our process. And so here we, um, a student annotator would go into the system and we asked them to give their first impression of a social media post, of a Twitter post without any context. And so in this particular post, I've been up for like three days straight and then a set of emojis. We, and the annotator, the student annotator, annotator says, well, he hasn't slept in days. So this isn't really helpful context, doesn't give us much more information. It's not really gonna help us to inform our decision-making around how we will then label this particular post. Then we ask the annotator, Go get more context. Go back to the social media posts. Get some web-based resources like Hip Hop Wiki. Go back to the author. Look at the peer network. Someone may claim to be gang identified, but following Disney characters. So trying to identify the discontinuity there. Looking at offline events and how offline events happening in the neighborhood, school, and the community shape how people talk and use language within the neighborhood. We're looking at the plurality of posts, what's being shared, and who's engaging with those posts. So now the annotator has collected all of this context, and now they have a lot more to say. So now the annotator says, this user is saying that he hasn't been up for three days straight, most likely meaning he hasn't slept for three days. This post comes days after his friend was killed. This user may be having difficulty sleeping because of his friend's death. He includes a persevering emoji and a flush face emoji. So now the annotator has a lot more context to work with when trying to make a decision on how they will then label that particular Twitter post. And so we identified a set of um, labels, machine learning labels uh, that were most predominant in Jakira's um, Twitter feed and connections with her larger network. And, the, and those two labels were grief and aggression. The challenging part about being a social scientist working in computer science is this need to put things in very neat boxes. And so there's lots of other behaviors that were equally as important, but weren't as predominant as grief and aggression, and those things were collapsed as other. And so our labels were loss, aggression, and other. 
But before, so our goal is to then hand this off to our colleagues in computer science at Columbia. But before we do that, we go back to those domain experts um, and study the disagreement between how a student annotator is looking at the data and how a community experts looking at the data. And some of the things that we found is that the domain experts had community level insight. They understood place and context and time. They may have had a backstory around a house or an address or an intersection that could demarcate an invisible boundary between two rival gangs. They understood people. They may have known someone in the who was being um, um, listed in a post. And they understood hand gestures and clothing and, and, and how to make meaning of those posts as well. So we, we then wanted to test, you know, this, using this hand label con contextual approach help us to have more accurate, accurate algorithmic um, uh, systems. And so, you know, on the test set, uh, the model trained on hand labeled hand labels from my lab achieved an F score of 64%. So 64% of the time, the algorithm system was correctly identifying grief um, and aggression. While the distant model that was not hand trained scored 52%, um, um, had an F score of 52%. And so when considering the question of whether it is worthwhile to manually annotate a corpus, it is useful to compare the performance of a model using the data of the, this data to performance of the same model of a data set created without such investment. In this case, we use our baseline performance of our um, support vector model on a distantly labeled data set where samples are labeled by the presence or absence of handpicked um, indicator words for each class, a simple and natural method of, um, of gathering data that makes use of our annotators expertise and does not require them to manually label thousands of tweets. And so we understood that having um, hand labeled data um, did help us to have a more um, accurate, um, a more accurate data set. But what the Kazan process also um, forces us to do is to engage in a more reflexive thinking around whether or not having an accurate algorithm that identifies African-American language, African-American people, do we want a system that does that well? Is that gonna be helpful in preventing violence or could a system that is really acute at identifying African-American language um, in, um, uh, pick up more toxic inferences that end up being more harmful that lead to increased surveillance, um, increased tracking of individuals within the police um, system that could then lead to um, um, can then lead to um, more arrests um, in this space. So this work is um, culminating uh, in a book that I am currently writing that I need to finish. So if you see me at Penn, please remind me to finish this book <laughs> called uh, Finding Jakira um, Lessons on Violence and Loss. And so I wanted to just kind of give you a quote from Jakira's mother, because one of the things that I think a lot about and I've been concerned about is, is, is doing this work helpful? Would Jakira's mom want me to be doing this work? Is this work going to help us understand the problem of violence or is it just going to create um, additional ethical challenges within these communities? So what, um, what Jakara's mom shared with me is, I was hurt and in pain. I was a million things, but I was numb to the fact because this happened so many times previously. What do I do now? What do I do? Do I do what other parents do? They don't wanna talk about it. We're just waiting on the next kid to die. I never got a chance to really grieve because I had to jump back into life going and going. I just vowed to her on her deathbed, I wouldn't let her name go in vain. So this is um, from Chantel Brown, Jakira's mom, uh, which really has um, been the impetus for the continuation of this work, but to also focus on elements of the work that are not about aggression and threats, but about grief and about well-being and about loss and the impact of those particular concepts on young people and how they talk online, but also the community around them as well. So as I said before, um, we work very closely with our computer science colleagues. So it's been a wonderful experience to be a social scientist who, who uses 
qualitative methods to train algorithmic systems and to identify errors and output for artificial intelligence systems as well. Uh, the partnership has, has been with Kathy McEwen, who is an expert at text, um, text summarization at Columbia University and the current Dean of the School of Engineering at Columbia University. I'm Dr. Shifu Chang, who is an expert in computer vision. And so we actually started off in a very different approach. And so we kind of leaned into my qualitative background. And instead of starting with a big data approach, we really started with a thick data approach. So started small because we questioned whether or not these artificial intelligence systems would be useful at all. And so we developed a computational system that classified tweets uh, from our corpus into aggression, grief statements, or emotions, or other. Our supervised machine learning utilizes training data by the qualitative analysis coding team, which is, a set, which is my safe lab team. The data set includes just 616 tweets that were used to train the classifier, and 102 tweets used to tune the parameters of the classifier. Uh, for the NLP system, we qualitatively coded an additional 310 tweets from the tweets from the two weeks prior to Jakira's friend's um, death uh, to provide more data for the classifier. And then we then tested the classifier to see how well it would perform on a held out test set of 102 tweets. The features with which we experimented included words, um, biograms, emojis, parts of speech taggers, and indications of the strength and the quality of the emotion um, uh, associated with the words in the tweet drawn from the Dictionary of Affective Language. And so in this particular um, um, initial experiment, we have um, published it within, um, uh, in this article here, um, automatically processing tweets from gang-involved youth. And the, what we learned is that the F score, uh, when, when using this thick descriptive approach, um, netted out to around 62%. So we were um, able to correctly find um, uh, the labels of aggression um, and grief with 62% um, um, accuracy in this space. In our next experiment, we had a new label data set that was six times larger than the prior one. Uh, we then use um, domain-specific resources induced from uh, the unlabeled data set. And we also use con context features that capture semantic and emotional content and users' recent posts in their interactions with other users. And so then when we did that, um, the F measure increased. We were able to get to almost 70%. And so our report shows that integrating emotions and semantic content of a user's recent posts is an important component for the task of predicting aggression and loss in social media posts of gang-involved youth. Furthermore, using uh, domain-specific embeddings um, and an aggression loss um, lexicon induced from a corpus of language constructed to represent a specific community of users is also critical to success. Our experiments also reveal that our snowballing technique to find these users is more effective than a location-based approach and that fitting our community is more complex than resorting to the demographics as captured in the African-American corpus. Um, and then lastly, we also explored um, the use of images. And so we gathered almost 2,000 tweets and accompanying um, annotations related to visual concepts and the psychosocial codes, aggression, loss, and then added substance use. We compared various methods for classifying tweets into these three classes using only the text of the tweet, only the image of the tweet, or both modalities as input to the classifier. In particular, we analyzed the usefulness of mid-level visual concepts and the role of our different modalities for this tweet classification task. Our experiments show that individually, text information dominates classification performance of the loss class, while image information dominates the aggression and substance use classes as well. Here is an example of the types of images that we would draw our bounding boxes around to feed algorithmic systems. These are not pictures from the actual data set, but these are from a Google um, um, uh, a Google stockpile, but they wanted you to see the types of content we were able to extract as well. So, so many of you might be wondering, you know, 
is this big brother, you know, is this helpful? Is this harmful? What are the ethical challenges in deploying this work? And so I think this is something that I think about extensively. And a part of the challenge is that this work really sits between two critical issues. When I talk to Black families, they want their children to be safe. And they desire any tool that is going to ensure that their child is going to be able to go to and from school, to and from a location, and get back home safely in the arms of their parents and caregivers. And so a tool like this, if it's helpful, could be used then um, I'd help outreach workers and social workers who are working on the ground to be able to identify local beefs and taunts happening within a community and use those things as data points that then determine how they're going to intervene in real time or the types of resources they need to identify so that they can get ahead of the conversations before they get too aggressive. And then conversely, we know that digital surveillance and policing enacting, enhancing, can enact and enhance yet another form of state violence on Black people and communities. So I, if you want to think about CHASM as a tool, I think we should understand that CHASM should be accompanied by a robust set of ethical guidelines. And there are a couple of things that we should be considering. We should be thinking about the consequences of applying algorithmic tools to complex social problems and, 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 and asking ourselves, what are our non-negotiables in that space? Reimagining or reconsidering the measurement as success for NLP outputs. And so how helpful is it to have a 100% accurate tool that identifies African-American language in the violence, within a violent context? Does that help us to prevent violence? Or does it help us to have other uh, explanations for why we will then surveil and track Black people? And then re and really consider the extraction of context when using NLP and how language processing systems are derived, analyzed, and validated in this space. So as I said, we, we, the, the whole point of this was to really help those outreach workers. We couldn't do that because we understand the ethical challenges and we understand that there's still deeply racialized framings for how people then interpret what they see on social media. And there's lots of examples of how and where this has gone wrong. And so we have never deployed this tool on any criminal justice case and we have only used historical data. Um, and we have had to reimagine um, how this particular tool could help which I think is a more useful tool for understanding the problem of violence as opposed to thinking that we can predict violent behavior of violent people. So, you know, some of my theoretical work, I've been developing a conceptual framework to theorize how in an era, an era of big data and criminal justice practice, social media policing, excuse me, social media policing um, uh, may ad adversely affect communities of color. So for example, I critique how race affects social media policing through the juxtaposition of social media use during the 2014 arrest of Black youth in New York City, who you see on your screen here, in the New York City public housing based on Facebook data, compared to the post hoc social media monitoring in the case of Dylan Ruff, the perpetrator of the Charleston church shooting in 2015 that killed nine people, including Senator Pimenta Pinckney, um, the other individual that was um, involved in the synagogue shooting outside of Pittsburgh as well. Again, these are post hoc um, reviews as opposed to the um, initial reviews for the young Black men you see before you. And so there are just a few takeaways that I want to leave with you. Um, I think social media should be understood as a community, as a neighborhood where people are living their lives that isn't necessarily distinct from the offline world. I think that social media can be a powerful tool for understanding and preventing root causes of violence. And I think the artificial intelligence offers an opportunity to augment and bolster current violence prevention efforts. However, social media and AI are not the sole answers to violence prevention. It will not use thoughtfully and correctly. I think social media and AI can be used for tools for surveillance and mass incarceration. Context is really important. I think it's really important for the user, for the researcher to be engaged in a set of processes where they uncover and recognize their own personal and institutional biases that influence um, how we collect data, how we validate and interpret um, 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 uh, the data sets that we create um, and how those tools are then deployed within communities. It's especially important to consider when using um, social media AI within a violence prevention context. 
and want to underscore this point that this work should never be done alone. And it's important to have critical and diverse perspectives. You have to have an inclusive team and voices that can help you think and anticipate that some of the challenges of how these tools are, um, might be deployed in, um, in diverse community um, settings. So we've learned a lot. And I think um, what we've learned is that we have to um, take a full core approach that a data science approach alone is not enough and not good enough because of the sensitivities and the cultural differences and the nuances and how communities write and connect and engage on social media platforms. We, we need to listen and to hear and to be in trust with the partnerships with community members. We also understood that focusing only on aggression and threats is a part of the problem. It's how we are viewing people as threatening and bad versus understanding a um, larger range of social, social factors that affect how people engage and see one another as well. And so it's shifted how we think about the research questions that we ask of data. So some of the examples of that have been in two projects that I want to um, briefly mention. One is our new neighborhood. Um, Navigated, this is a tool that we built with the New York City, um, with New York City's mayor's office and in collaboration with um, low income residents all throughout New York City. And one of the things is, that we did is that we used um, social media data to validate the things that we were seeing and uh, hearing in our in depth interviews with NYCHA, with low income residents in New York City. And what this really helped us to do was to see the overlapping connections between social so, um, uh, social economic um, factors that affect how people live in cities. We understood the, um, how, how climate and housing conditions affect how people see themselves and how that may also trigger um, issues of violence as well. And so in one of those interviews, what we heard from one of the residents was the biggest concern that I have for my neighborhood that I may would like to see changes in is more affordable housing. I'm talking about people owning their own houses, but if there's no jobs and no housing, people can't see themselves growing. It's just chaos, bro. And so this was a really important contextual feature that helped us to understand the types of factors that could impact violent behavior as well. We also understood that um, there's other ways in which we might be able to intervene in um, troubling language, and that's through the use of identifying joy and how users were always were already using concepts of joy and laughter and fun to intervene. So this has then um, um, informed a new project around finding joy as an intervention to gun violence. And so we are working with young people in both New York City and Philadelphia um, to um, to define concepts of joy and then to partner with data scientists to use those definitions to find these concepts of joy and to help people who are looking for joy on social media more readily find them by breaking down the barriers between these algorithmic black holes that keep people in particular networks and helping people to kind of coalesce and connect and convene around these concepts of joy, um, all the while applying design justice principles um, to um, make sure that we are creating uh, and working with our community members to have more accessible and culturally responsive tools as well. Uh, we are also um, focused on grief because we found grief to be a, 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 um, an initial step in shifting how people talk online. And so we would see examples of folks um, um, having a grief expression, folks disrespecting that grief, and then that disrespect of grief leading towards more aggressive and threatening language, particularly within a two-day window. And so we have created a digital diary um, platform called um, Integrating Emotional Stories Online, or IESO, to better understand the types of language um, that is used to, um, um, to express grief and to talk about trauma. And so we um, uh, have over 300 posts from about um, 134 um, um, users from Columbia University students to Black residents in Harlem. And it all started with the simple question is uh, of how are you doing? And so this particular system um, is meant to identify those different um, 
variations in language and to train algorithmic systems to identify these digital signals with the hopes of being able to be a training tool for clinicians who may be um, working in the grief and loss space as well. And I'm just going to end with a kind of a quick plug. You know, we are excited to be at Penn, and I am building the new Penn Center for Inclusive Innovation and Technology, which aims to be a new site for building pub the public interest technology field. Um, this new center will fuse anti-racist framework, social work thinking, rigorous analytical um, methods to tackle the most thorny social issues to include but not limited to gun violence, trauma, grief, and also joy as well. And so if you are interested in this space, um, certainly look forward to partnering with you in this new center. So I'm um, happy to be connected. Thank you so much. Um, please reach out to me via email or on Twitter as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Uh, I want to uh, remind our audience members that you can put questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll be able to read them. Um, and maybe I'll start first. And first I wanted to ask you, because there's been some discussion about Twitter's new data access rules that will make social media research harder. And I'm wondering if um, in general, in terms of uh, doing research with social media posts, in addition obviously to the issues around bias and uh, consent, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges, especially for the future uh, research that is to be conducted in that space? You, so this is a great question. I think on the one hand, we certainly need regulation and ethical frameworks and guidelines for ethical use of social media data when it's applied to society more broadly. And we have seen and experienced what happens when there are no ethical guidelines in place or when those guidelines are um, not strong, right? And so I think that as kind of an overarching um, idea, we continuously need work in that space. However, there are lots of great projects and great researchers that are leveraging social media to tackle our most thorniest um, issues from health and mental health to education and um, workplace and everything in climate and everything in between. And what I like about social media is that you get a diversity of thought and a diversity of experience because folks are posting from their authentic self, from their aspirational self, they're connecting ideas with other people. They're using both text and video and music to express and to um, connect. And then there's comments. There's lots of important data points that I think could really um, uh, accelerate our solutions to our, to our thorniest problems. And so, um, to lessen access or to make that more difficult, I don't think it's going to help us. I think it's going to harm us in really big ways, especially as our world, our lives become more digital. And so we're not going to become a less digital society. And so people are going to be commenting and engaging more and to not be able to understand that as a diagnostic or to use AI to leverage social media as a diagnostic tool, as a comparative tool, I think will be more harmful than good. Um, another question has to do with uh, the researcher's perspective, obviously with the work that sometimes uh, includes communities or people with lived experience who may become even part of the team. There's some challenges in terms of um, perhaps uh, outdated structures or processes that the IRB or other mechanisms that uh, a researcher has to navigate. So I was wondering if you could comment on how the work you do, especially because your work combines both the technological developments as well as the um, most uh, important social science concepts and uh, emerging trends, how, how easy or difficult is it to navigate a research space that may not always necessarily be up to date in terms of methodologies and approaches? This is a great question. I was just having this conversation with 
um, with folks from city, you know, the, the folks that give us those IRB exams. And it was so it was interesting because I was talking to them. I was like, you know, we really need IRB modules on ethical uses of AI for, you know, a host of social science and medical you know, research projects. And they said, oh, we have them. We have a lot of them. We've been developing them from years. And like, I have been doing this for a decade and I've never had a single exam on this to get um, IRB certified. And they said, well, it's up to the university and it's up to schools to make decisions around whether or not they will add, you know, this level of content to the IRB. And I was like, on one end, I get it because I just, I just finished my IRB certification. It took me a very long time to complete. And I also believe that these, this is a critically um, um, necessary. So I think that there, I think there is room for improvement. These modules and tools exist. And I think that A, we need to support uh, folks who are on the IRB having training in that space and then being able to tap into the modules that already exist at places like City, so that we can then make sure that folks have this kind of background before they're deploying it in a, um, in a research context. Great. We have a few more questions in the Q&A box and I wanna remind our audience members, feel free to post your questions there. The first one isn't really a question, just somebody who said that they really appreciate your talk. It's interesting work and so different from what we usually get to hear about AI. Thank you. And the second question also comments on the wonderful work and says, what is your take on the epistemological problems when trying to use heavily quantitative methods, particularly AI and machine learning in social science and to solve very difficult to quantify or define qualitative issues? It's a good question. And it's really, it's been such a joy and um, an exciting effort to be a qualitative person in a data science space. And one of the things that I've learned is that the insights that we glean qualitatively are critically important to understanding problems. And I think regardless if you were trained as a positivist or you know, um, a qualitative expert, understanding the problem remains an important first step. And I think that there's a clear space for deeper work in that space. And I have not experienced any resistance with collaborating with my data science colleagues because they quickly understand what they don't know. And the qualitative insights helps to help, helps them to understand the problem, helps them to understand where their expertise begins and ends. And it helps us to create, I think, more thoughtful algorithmic system because they're wrestling with context and nuance and emotions in ways that they may not traditionally do in another, you know, a data science project. Um, and so I've been very lucky to work with data scientists that are so willing to grapple with these big questions, um, but it's not the standard. And so I think that a part of it, a big part of it begins with training. And I really think that computer science departments, data science departments need to expand beyond um, just having an AI ethics module, but should also include um, learnings from qualitative methods, from anthropology, from other social science disciplines when conceptualizing whether or not a data science approach is a necessary or the most useful approach to solve or to work on a societal problem. Great. Well, I want to thank you again for joining us uh, and giving us this wonderful presentation. I want to remind our audience members that uh, our next webinar is going to be on June 1st and we have Dr. Kevin Johnson presenting and that will be our last, our last webinar for this academic year. You can always watch the recordings of our webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I want to thank you all for attending and again, Dr. Patton, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks.